are, are really, really delighted to have Mark Leibovich here uh, in this town to talk about this town. Actually, the title of his new book is This Town, Two Parties and a Funeral, Plus Plenty of Valet Parking in America's Gilded Capital. Now, most of you know that books about Washington rarely generate the kind of anticipation or maybe buzz in Washington parlance, although in this case, terror might be the appropriate word, uh, that this one has. It's only been out a week, but Mother Jones reported that Politico alone has published 17 items about it, including one that preemptively warned uh, months ago that this town was an incest book. And another complaining that, quote, it's no small irony that a guy who has embraced the A-list soirees of D.C. ends up toppling the hors d'oeuvre trays. <laughs> but, uh, Mark, judging from the crowd here tonight, you still have a few friends left in Washington. So, uh, And I, I do have to make a confession. Um, Brad and I had to fight over who was going to introduce Mark tonight. Uh, many of you may know that Brad worked for several decades as a journalist at the Washington Post before becoming a bookstore owner. And in my previous life, I was also a reporter at the Post and then worked for many years for Hillary Clinton, which is uh, how I first got to know Mark. Now, maybe that doesn't make us bona fide members of the club that you write about, but uh, perhaps we're somewhere on the periphery of the periphery. Um, and, <laughs> and guess what? Uh, neither of us is mentioned in the book. <laughs> and yes, we did have to read all 368 pages to find this out. That was before the Post so conveniently published its unofficial index of the book with no index. But far be it from us to be petty and self-important about this. What we really cared about, quite honestly, was not whether we were in the book, but we cared about whether politics and prose was in the book. And, and it's not. Um, but, but you can imagine how reassuring it was for us to read the following item in a roll call blog earlier today. Quote, Mark Leibovich heads into the belly of the beast tonight. The New York Times scribe brings his portrait of Washington to the bookstore most affiliated with the landed gentry he skewers, <laughs> politics and prose. So um, honestly, uh, thanks are in order that we didn't warrant any ink in this book because really it's kind of a good news, bad news thing to be mentioned in this town. Bad news because if you're anywhere in it but the acknowledgments, you probably come across as a navel-gazing, hypocritical Washington blowhard. <laughs> Good news because having been eviscerated, however humorously, elegantly, and even at times compassionately by Mark, you're now much more likely to sign a multi-million dollar book deal orchestrated by Bob Barnett, <laughs> become a regular on Morning Joe, and be feted at a swanky party hosted by Tammy Haddad. Uh, those of you who have already read the book uh, know it's also very funny, as in burst out into hysterical laughter kind of funny, but it's also not so funny. Uh, tragic comic actually, meaning you laugh and then you scream. Because this town, the town not the book, um, has today become much more than a terrible caricature of itself. The political media ecosystem that defines our nation's capital is a shameless and insular cesspool of money and celebrity that taints even the purest of the pure. It's a theater of the absur absurd, and this is what Mark has chronicled so devastatingly and so brilliantly. Please join me in welcoming Mark Leibovich to Paul. That was a great introduction, I think. Um, Thank you all for coming. I mean, this is this is amazing, and I, I will say, first of all, um, I'm not such a bad guy, but politics and prose is one of my. It, it's it, if I'm going to talk about what might be bad about Washington, I want to talk for a few minutes about what is really good about Washington, and we could start with this place. I am. This is not me sort of trying to curry favor with the owners. Um, it is. Our family bookstore, it is our neighborhood bookstore, it is a place we have come for years and my daughters were not truly excited for this book to be out until they saw it on the shelves of Politics and Prose and <laughs> my middle daughter was uh, actually wanted a picture with it and I sent it to all our relatives. So um, it's great to be here and especially you know when a book is has all this anticipation, people talk about well what are the Amazon pre-orders and what was what what the ranking. Um, we love Amazon. Actually, maybe we don't. Do we love Amazon? Okay, we don't love Amazon. But I, I hope that if you haven't, sorry, well, I guess C-SPAN isn't, well, I guess the podcast. Um, 
if you haven't bought the book, I hope you will, and I hope you'll buy it here. And if you have bought the book, I hope you'll buy every other book here. Because I, I say this not just as a sort of someone supporting the community bookstore, which of course is important, but I say this as someone who truly loves the store and whose family really loves the store. And on a personal note, um, Brad, I've, I've worked with for many years, Lissa, um, now you never use the word source, but um, I got to know her. Well, so, Lissa has always been offering valuable guidance to me <laughs> over the years, uh, given her knowledge of the Clinton orbit and my occasionally writing about them. So. Um, anyway, it is really, really good to be here, and um, it, it's really, really good to have a book to talk about because, as Lissa said, there was so much kind of anticipation, speculation, guesswork about what this book would be. And um, finally, I'm done, and here it is, and people are reading it, and, and people are actually have something tangible to ask me about and to yell at me about and, and what have you. And, and I, I will say that this town is essentially a profile. And it's not a profile of any one person, despite everyone sort of speculating or saying who came off worst or who came off OK. It's a profile of a city in a moment. And I would say that that moment's the 21st century. And it's a moment of a, tritty, of a city transformed um, by wealth, by new media, by celebrity. Um, and what it does is it charts a five-year period in the life of the city beginning in June of 2008 at the funeral of Tim Russert and ending, I guess a little, maybe four and a half years, ending with Barack Obama's second inauguration. And it sort of charts the life of the city through the Obama change brigades and their experience here, but ultimately through this incredible change in media that we've seen, this incredible change in the economy. I mean, the local economy has just been humming right along. I mean, this is the wealthiest community in the United States home to seven of the wealthiest 10 counties in the United States, this, this metropolitan area, at a time when the rest of the country's economy has completely faltered, at a time of incredible disconnect between the disappointment that so much of the country feels for its capital city and what seems to be a time when the capital city has reached a tipping point of self-celebration, I guess is, is how I put it. Um, so I, I embarked on this really in 2010, but the first scene is 2008. And it's, um, it's with Tim Russert's funeral. And, and in the time, I guess people sort of knew I was working on this book. So uh, there have been little spasms of, of news cycles in which people were talking about it. There was one instance a few years ago when one of my subjects, who was the press secretary for Daryl Issa, a Republican in Congress, was uh, sharing emails with me from people who didn't know their emails were being shared. They were reporters, some were members of Congress, and he was doing this in the guise of trying to show me how he spent his days because he was a staff person who was rather enamored of his own narrative, and uh, which is dangerous for a staff person, as anyone who's worked on a political staff can tell you. And Politico caught wind of this. It became a huge story. Um, I think in addition to the 17 stories that they wrote about the book, they probably wrote about two dozen more in that one week alone in 2011. And the media started writing about the media, and everyone was writing disclaimers about how everyone knew each other and how everyone is friends with each other. And that gave rise to what I think is my favorite line about this whole book, which was written in a tweet by my friend John Dickerson, who is the White House reporter for Slate. And he was writing about this media free-for-all and everyone writing about each other and everyone critiquing each other and everyone focusing on each other in a, on a week in which you know revolution was breaking out in Egypt. Uh, the Republicans were threatening to shut down the government, and, and this was the biggest story, at least on Capitol Hill. And John, uh, actually, I'll read you two paragraphs. They're, neither of them are in my own words, but I think they're pretty emblematic. In his Washington Post column, Dana Milbank, a friend wrote that, quote, if Washington's political culture gets any more incestuous, our children are going to be born with extra fingers, unquote. <laughs> And then, I like the best thing written about the whole episode was on Twitter by John Dickerson, a political writer for Slate, talking head for CBS News, and a you-know-what of mine. Quote, instead of writing a book about how self-involved Washington is, Dickerson wrote, Mark Leibovich has gotten people to act, on a, act it out in real time. <laughs> um, which I thought was very distilling in the moment. And, and, and actually, I think he, said, he put out a similar tweet after Politico wrote their pre preemptive piece speculating on what would be in it. This was like six weeks ago. Anyway. Um, so uh, what I want to do is read a couple passages. I would then love to turn this over to questions because I, and I'm a journalist, I much prefer give and take. I do not like giving speeches. 
Um, I don't like reading to people. Well, I love reading to people, but um, I would rather you buy the book and absorb it on your own terms. Um, and uh, then hopefully we'll just embark on a conversation. So, um, so this is at the end of the Tim Russert memorial service. And this was a state funeral-like event. I mean, it was compared to a state funeral. Sally Quinn actually said it was not since Ronald Reagan's funeral and Gerald Ford's funeral has Washington been so shaken by someone's departure. Live TV coverage, NBC especially, because that's where Tim Russert worked. Um, Tim Russert was what I call the mayor of official Washington. He was someone who lived at the nexus of politics and money and media. Um, he was really the center of where politicians had to go to sort of test their mettle. He was kind of an arbiter. Uh, he also came from a political background. He, wrote, he worked for Mario Cuomo and Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And his death was just this jarring moment. And I focused on the Kennedy Center spectacle because it was just that, a spectacle. It was a memorial service that all the tribes showed up at, the Clintons, the Obamas, the McCains, the Democrats, the Republicans, the lobbyists, the hangers on, the media. Um, people were talking on TV about it for days. And I remember sitting there, I was, I was a guest, I didn't know Tim Russer well, but I was invited and I just remember seeing it immediately devolve, at least even before it began, into a cocktail party. And not literally a cocktail party, although there was one afterwards on the Kennedy Center roof. But people working it, people trying to get David Axelrod booked on their shows, people running up, actually literally a booker for MSNBC, running up to Hillary Clinton to try to get her to come on Keith Oberman's show that night. Um, people angling to replace Tim Russert. Uh, and Tom Brokaw actually had a great line. He said, welcome friends, family, and the biggest group of all, those who think that they will replace Tim Russert on Meet the Press. <laughs> so anyway, um, this is a long chapter. It's the first chapter. It's also the prologue, and it sets the scene. It introduces a lot of the characters who recur through the four and a half year narrative. Um, and uh, I will read the end of this first chapter. Um, OK. The Kennedy Center Memorial Service is broadcast live on MSNBC, complete with pregame and postgame. Luminary speakers, polished remarks, Brokaw hosting a rolling, hoisting a rolling rock at the lectern, and Bruce Sp Springsteen materializing via satellite from Germany. Brian Williams, the NBC News anchor, is given a prime place in the murderer's row of celebrity eulogists. The Russert family is um, surprised about this, since Williams was never one of Tim's guys. Nor is the family happy about the presence at the funeral of former NBC president Andrew Lack, who Tim despised, or the degree to which T NBC has hijacked the Kennedy Center time as a network branding opportunity. But such a dance is part of living and dying as public property. They understand that, as Tim must have understood it, that the, and the Russert family will benefit, none more so than Luke Russert, who already has his own sports talk show on XM Satellite Radio with he and Tim's buddy, James Carville. Luke's amazing eulogy will effectively launch his television career. He will be hired by NBC soon after, just like McCain's kid and W's kid and eventually Bill and Hillary's kid. At some point, NBC became a full employment agency for famous political offspring. Um, but Luke is a special prince and will eventually be assigned the Capitol Hill beat for MSNBC, where he'll become our congressional sage before his 26th birthday and be auctioned off for charity. Uh, tour of the Capitol and lunch with Luke Russert, current bid $1,150. He will grow nicely into the family business, but today's service is a star turn for Luke. Funny, sentimental, and poised to a point where you could hear almost half of Bethesda and Chevy Chase hissing at their inner teenage college-age sons, why can't you be more like Tim Rus uh, Luke Russert? Um, Tim spoke with bottomless pride about Luke, his only child. They talked every day. For pioneering the joys of fatherhood, Tim was rightly recognized among other accolades. The National Father's Day Council named him Father of the Year in 1995, and Parents Magazine honored him as Dream Dad for 1998. Washington eats up the dad conceit. Unusually high portions of ambitious men and potential male book buyers love to self-mythologize through their fathers. John Edwards was the son of a mill worker, John Boehner the son of a barkeeper, etc. The prevailing social dynamic in Washington, a city of patrons, mimics the quest for paternal love. Who do you work for is typically the first thing people ask here. Russert, who described Moynihan as his intellectual father, died just before Father's Day at the dawn of a general election campaign that featured two presumptive nominees, Obama and McCain, whose sagas were steeped in fraught paternal legacies. Obama's memoir was titled Dreams of My Father, while McCain's was Faith of My Father's. A man's either trying to live up to his father's mistakes or live up to his expectations, Obama told John, Newsweek's John Meacham that summer. 
My dad was my best friend, eulogized Luke, 22. To explain my bond with my father is utterly impossible to put into words. And then the white screen rolls down and Springsteen enters via satellite. Like Bruce, Tim Rosser deftly made himself a spokesman for America. He was the boss of the nostalgic male playgrounds he presided over in the nation's capital. Luke, this is for your pop, Springsteen says, leading into an acoustic version of Thunder Road. As I walk out, I get a big hug from Tammy Haddad, a, a, cable, uh, a veteran cable producer who repurposed herself in recent years as a professional party host, event organizer, and full-service convener of the Washington A-List. Haddad, a towering in-your-face presence with black hair bisected by a white streak, is a human ladle in the local self-celebration buffet. She tells you how great you are, how you really need to meet the author or co-host or honoree or whoever, and that, by the way, she just talked to Justice Breyer. Over the Rainbow plays as Tammy and I and the rest of the club schmooze our way up the Kennedy Center roof for an actual cocktail party. And there, glowing, glowing over the Potomac and the monuments, a double rainbow, surely a message from heaven's green room to the power mourners now sipping Heineken's and white wine. Everyone says so. Is anyone still an atheist now, Luke asks, according to Tammy, who will write a blog post later about the Russert miracles, or an opposing viewpoint on the rainbow from the since-departed atheist Christopher Hitchens, writing in Slate. No benign deity plucks television news show hosts from their desks in the prime of life and then hastily compensates their friends and family by displays of irradiated droplets in the sky, unquote. God could not be reached for comment, but let us at least agree that he is obviously quite attuned to the doings of politics and media. That is why so many would-be leaders say they are being called upon for run for, to run for president and why eulogists lean so heavily on the trope that God runs in the human resources department that recruits people like Sunday hosts and yachtsmen into heaven. When Andy Rooney died a few years later, the CBS anchor Scott Pelley compared Rooney, Rooney to Cicero and Dickens and certified that, quote, apparently God needed a writer. Parenthetical. Apparently CBS did not because Rooney had just been pushed out a month earlier. Um, <laughs> And God just loves Washington, of that we are certain. His presence is indeed potent at the Kennedy Center, although everyone kept looking around, looking for someone more important to talk to. Uh, Tammy couldn't stop talking about the Russert Rainbow. It makes for an enthralling, powerful, and stagnant spectacle, that same wonderland feel that can make Washington mo Washington's monuments seem like a stage set. Is it real or paper mache? Or maybe God meant the rainbow to resemble an NBC peacock, a celestial branding play. Whatever, it all fits the, quote, narrative of a momentous time. It is no longer enough just to follow the unsexy business of governance in the seat of power. No more boring and stodging in this town. Vintage square rooms have given way to lightheaded news cycles and public servants have gra graduated into killer personal franchises. The Washington story has become something more momentous, befitting a narrative, a pumped up word and a pumped up place where everything is changing, maybe more than in any other city in the country, in line with the hopeful imperative of the next president. Or maybe nothing is changing at all, and the only certainty is that the city fathers of this town will endure like perennials in a well-tended cemetery. So, that is okay. now. Thanks. Um, that actually went on longer than I thought, so I think I'm going to not read the second little passage. And um, I think, just for time's sake, uh, if everyone, what do you think? I think maybe we'll just go right to questions. Or is there is there demand for questions? Because I can talk, I can read, I can. What do you think, uh, well, I, mean, what? <laughs> I think well. Okay. All right. I'm going to read one more passage. Great. Hey, I'm happy to read. Um, and uh, okay. So this flash forward less than four years later. Uh, the last quarter of the book is given over to the 2012 presidential campaign, and um, one of the recurring themes of the book <coughs> is that Washington is incapable of letting go of embarrassing, useless, awful traditions that it just keeps doing. Uh, a great example is the White House Correspondents' Dinner, which um, over the years has just metastasized into not just a single banquet, but you know, a five-day extravaganza of pre-parties and post-parties and Hollywood people and and tens of millions of dollars spent on entertainment and food and shrimp and because you know a single banquet is no longer sufficient to celebrate the full achievements of the Washington political class, right? So, um, and yet, I mean, this ultimate bubble world that materializes here every fall, everyone knows it's awful. It's actually become perverse. It, people claim to hate it. Uh, it continues. 
the president continues to come every year, no matter who it is. It is an endorsement, I mean, a tacit endorsement, an explicit endorsement, that this somehow continues, this ostentatious waste and, and, and I don't know, I just think it's an embarrassment. So um, another one of these little institutions is the spin room. Now it's not as expensive, but a spin room is, as I think many of you know, it is a room after a debate, uh, usually a presidential debate, but, but you know, Senate debates also, where the media gathers and the spinmeisters of the two campaigns and the surrogates and the people representing the candidates go and they spin. Um, a spin is essentially either a shading of the truth, a lie, um, what have you. But I think the full-on uselessness of this is, is described in the name, and yet the name endures almost without irony, and it continues. And the spin room has become particularly useless in a time when campaign spin has moved into real time via Twitter, via email, via, I mean, you can sit in a debate now and, and you're getting press releases like in real time and statements and this is a lie and this is a fact check and everything. And, and yet people still go in and like there are all these TV cameras around and uh, people try to spin you and it's, it's useless. And yet they endure and one of the things I did, I, there was a scene in South Carolina in late January of last year, probably the middle of the Republican um, primaries. And I encountered Bay Buchanan. Does anyone know who Bay Buchanan is? She is uh, Pat Buchanan's sister. She's a Republican operative, CNN pundit, like half the people in this room was a former host of Crossfire on CNN. Um, she ran Brother Pat's three presidential campaigns. Uh, she endorsed Mitt Romney, I think around maybe December of 2011. Um, and so they, they took her all over the country and she was spinning for Mitt Romney and appearing on CNN and doing what she does. Uh, she's very emblematic of the culture we have today in which punditry has sort of replaced reporting as the gold standard of my profession. And um, so I, I'm in the middle of South Carolina just sort of absorbing the scene because I wasn't, I wasn't on deadline or anything and there was Babe Buchanan. I think I met a few times, seems like a very nice woman. And um, so I, I wrote about it and this is what it looked like. And one of the things that you should know about the spin room, I mean like the high school analogy, which is way overused and, and the cliche, uh, spin rooms are like that too. I mean the really popular spinners like the governors are often mobbed by media. And then there are the people that aren't that popular, they're sort of standing by themselves and you sort of, you know, maybe a foreign press guy will come up to them and say, well, what did you think of the debate? And they'll say, well, I thought, um, you know, Newt Gingrich really hit it out of the park tonight or, or whatever. Anyway, so this, this is, um, I actually just sort of picked this at random, but this is my encounter with Bay Buchanan in late January of 2011 in uh, North Charleston, South Carolina. Hey, it's Bay Buchanan. Uh, you never know who you'll run into in the spin room. Actually, Bay Buchanan is precisely the specimen you run into in the spin room. Like copies of US News at the dentist's office, Bay Buchanan belongs in spin rooms. Spin rooms are hideous. They are where campaign aides and candidate surrogates gather after, debate, after candidate debates to ritually humor a crush of media types. Their currency includes the lobotomizing talking points about how candidate X, quote, really hit it out of the park tonight, or how candidate Y, quote, was the only one on stage who looked presidential. Candid insights like that. The rooms endure, for some reason, as routine appendages to the 8,000 or so debates that are inflicted during every, every presidential campaign. Buchanan, who is not hideous, lives in the political people on TV nether ooze in which you lose track of whether she is a pundit or an operative or a surrogate or some hybrid squid in the same way that you lose track of a lawyer for the SEC who takes a position at a DC lobbying firm or a Citigroup executive who takes a job at the SEC and is suddenly investigating his former and perhaps future colleagues. For all, I, uh, for all I can tell, Buchanan might have, been, might have even entered the world in a spin room after being conceived in the back of a satellite truck and, <laughs> and gestated in a green room to be hatched from the quivering egg incubated under warm TV lights into the welcoming obstetric hands of Wolf Blitzer. Um, that might be a little harsh, but... Um, it never changes. Uh, presidents do and elections come and go and new technologies like Twitter come along and revolutionize. Paradigm shift, mistakes are made, it all moves along. And then here we all are again, making our way back to the spin room with Bay Buchanan. This particular spin room is about the size of a tennis court. It is housed at a convention center in North Charleston, South Carolina, January 19th, 2012. 
The Republican primary race was kind of sort of threatening to get interesting again after default front, front runner Mitt Romney, after winning big in the New Hampshire primary, suffered through a few rough days here in the political septic tank or septic system of the Palmetto State. Newt Gingrich was getting a lot of attention. Key conservatives kept endorsing Newt and Rick Santorum, and Romney was being reduced to a well coiffed mound of jello every time someone asked him why he wasn't releasing his tax returns. So Bay Buchanan was here to defend Mitt. Uh, she has been a well-worn part of the cable schmear for years, a Republican activist and probably her biggest claim to fame, sister of Pat Buchanan. She ran Brother Pat's three losing presidential campaign and has campaigns and has achieved the mantle of, quote, prominent conservative over the years. Naturally, she was a, a guest co-host of CNN's Crossfire for a time. Uh, well, here we all are again, Buchanan said to me when I saw her in the spin room. Her greeting was a perfectly crystalline cliche to distill the unrelenting sameness of this exercise. Lots of the same people kicking around. She had endorsed Romney a few days before in the, New, in the New Hampshire primary, which moved the Romney campaign to actually put out a press release touting her support. This was no doubt why Mitt Romney won big in the Granite State. The Bay Buchanan brown, bounce. Okay, that's sarcasm. I do not mean to pick on Bay Buchanan, who seems very nice. Plus, you don't screw with Bay Buchanan, especially not in her house, the spin room. She conveyed a workmanlike sincerity when she said that, quote, Mitt Romney had an outstanding debate tonight. He truly did. The consensus, however, was that Romney did not have an outstanding debate tonight. He truly did not. Um, his poll numbers cratered accordingly in South Carolina, and he was eventually crushed by Gingrich. There was cheering in our war room tonight, Buchanan told me. It was a decisive victory. As with many things in politics, spin rooms mimic the social hierarchy of a junior high school cafeteria. The big ticket spinners attract the crowds and the smaller tickets attract fewer reporters or worse, members of the foreign press. Uh, with all due deference, uh, Buchanan is a puny ticket. She has much to say about why Romney, quote, hit it out of the park tonight, but few are listening. And she was looking slightly lonely in the corner, especially compared to the cool kids like Tim Pawlenty, the former Minnesota governor who was spinning for Romney, and Santorum, who was spinning for himself. Plus, Pawlenty and Santorum had multiple furry boom mics in their faces at any given time, the ultimate spin room status symbols. Um, if Buchanan had furry boom mic envy, she hit it well. But as we spoke, she achieved a kind of spin room rock bottom, suffering an indignity that triggered in me an emotion I never expected to feel on this great earth, genuine empathy for the likes of Bay Buchanan. Just as Bay started to get rolling, sharing with me how excited the Romney team was backstage during the debate, she was interrupted by a, pel uh, by a television reporter from Iceland. <laughs> hmm. um, Do you have a minute for Iceland, the reporter asked her, at which point, Buchanan drew a deep sigh and herniated a sense of physical deflation, literally closing her eyes as if to contemplate the full degradation she was suffering in the middle of the cafeteria with me bearing witness. This is what I've been reduced to, Buchanan said, before rallying herself to the pursuit of Romney voters in Reykjavik. And then she stood back and said, Iceland. Uh, so that was the end of that chapter. Um, and at, as an aside, as I was sort of coming down the stretch trying to finish this, my editor and publisher, David Rosenthal at Blue Rider Press, would occasionally just call me because um, he'd have something to talk to me about, and he would always begin his conversations with, do you have a minute for Iceland? <laughs> so it became our, our, little, uh, our little greeting. So anyway, so I now have a minute for Iceland and uh, many minutes for questions, and um, so I guess. Uh, so I have first. a question. I have a question. Good. Yeah. Um, it sounds like it's going to be a great book to a great read, a great summer beach read. Um, but it, you raise a serious question that the that Washington is completely um, uh, separate from the rest of the country. Um, so the country has no leadership. What do you? How do you think this can be resolved? That is the central point of this book. And, uh, and really, I mean, because there has been so much focus on, again, the nuggets. I mean, what, what, who's up, who's down, the anticipation, maybe some harsh lines. There is a larger point here, which is the disconnect, which is, I mean, this book I knew would have a lot of interest in places like this, sure. inside the Beltway. I think one of the things I've been asked a lot is, just what you just asked. What can we do about this? Can you be closer to the mic? Sure, sure, sure. Why can't we, I mean, you don't lay out prescriptions, and it's true. I don't have a chapter at the end in which I have 10 bullet points 
10 ways in which we can make Washington work. Uh, we should have term limits. We should have a third party candidate. We should have campaign finance or, or whatever. Um, and I, I think my answer is, as a journalist, I hold a mirror to this culture. I, I don't know if it's a cop out to say, but I, I think that what I do, and this is sort of a glib thing that one of the reviewers said, Everyone is disappointed in Washington, but this book enables you to be disappointed in Washington with greater specificity, <laughs> with greater passion, with a fuller cinemagraphic sense. And I, I love that, that people seem to be enjoying and delighting in this book and laughing out loud. I mean, that's all great. But no, I mean, I do think there is a serious point. And I think the initial response, I mean, based on what I've heard, and it's only been a few weeks, has been a combination of outrage delight, and, and even inside the Beltway, I've been surprised that a lot of people said that they've sort of thought about themselves more, they've thought about the system more, and, and again, I don't want to pick on one person or one party or one institution, I mean, this is, this is a profile of a city, and um, if I can flesh that out a little bit and any change comes from it, great, but um, that's sort of what I do as a journalist, though. So. Thanks. Hi. Um, you certainly shed your objectivity for this, it seems. Um, sure. How does that, so I have two questions really. One is how does that affect your reporting going forward? Because not only will sources still talk to you, as you know, I think you talked about with Charlie Rose, but is, right. you know, your, yourself, in, internally you went through a shift to do this. Right. Um, but the second question is really about your process. I mean, how did you decide um, to do this book and what was your process of actually writing it? Um, well, two very core questions. I mean, I think, first of all, um, I mean, the process was long, as my family here can attest, but um, the objectivity question is one I get a lot because I am not a beat reporter. I've never been a wire service reporter. I'm a feature reporter. I have had the license, if that's the right word, or the ability to write with a fair amount of voice for many, many years, first at the Washington Post in the style section, um, and now at the times where they've let me, again, write with a point of view. I mean, as a magazine writer, which is what I am now, I am allowed or encouraged to write with a point of view. So this is my take. I mean, I don't, again, I, I think, I, I have people, I mean, I write a lot of profiles, okay, and I, I actually have had the the pleasure and sometimes not pleasure of getting to know these people. and. I have n learned that, first of all, objectivity is not measured so much in s stripping bare the words and of, of all adjectives and, and of all opinion in your sentences. It's, it's sort of trying to keep an open mind no matter where you go, no matter who you're talking to. And okay. so I don't um, claim to be objective. I don't think any writer who says they're objective is being fully honest. I mean, I think there are more classically objective forms. Um, I think you would probably say, or anyone who's read my work over the years would say that I am someone who writes with a point of view. So in that sense, it wasn't that big of a jump. I mean, I think when, when it's your book and your name's on it and the New York Times name isn't on the top of it and you don't have a million editors, I mean, yes, you, you do have more leeway. But, you know, I don't have the luxury of being a foreign correspondent. I mean, I'm living here, I love politics, I intend to keep covering politics and, um, I, I think the fundamentals of journalism are such that, that you honor ground rules, you are straight with people, you write honestly, uh, you try not to surprise them, you, um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a messy process at times. I mean, it really, really is. People are complicated here as everywhere, and certainly the process of writing this book had some fits and starts, as my wife can attest and my friends can attest, but... Um, I got there, and that's you know the best part about this book right now is it's doneness, but um, which is I, I, yes, I mean it really feels good to be done with this. But yeah, I mean it's not there. There is no blueprint. I mean it's not like I could say this is how you do it and how I would do it again. I mean it, a lot of it is hit or miss, and maybe that's just sort of my style. So. Can I just good. ask how you made the time to write it? Literally, <laughs> Mary. Lack of sleep. <laughs> no, I yes, mean there lack was a of wife. Is that what happened? Yeah, um, no. I uh, it is. I mean, is anyone you put who put the kids in the closet? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As anyone who's written a book will will attest, 
there are a lot of sacrifices with family. Um, my family has been amazing. My friends have been amazing. I wrote a lot at night. I wrote a lot of weekends. Um, it came at the expense of family time. I'm sure my bosses would save my job. I had I took about a year off from the Times and didn't finish. Um, so then uh, it was just stealing time when I could. So, yeah. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Uh, as you know, this is a town where when people pick up a book, the first thing they do is look at the index to see if they're in it. <laughs> yes. And I'm curious, why no index? You just answered your question. <laughs> so, I w uh, there's this thing called the Washington Read, which is people walking into a place like Politics and Prose, going to the back of the book, and seeing if their name's there, first in the index, then the acknowledgments. And if they're not in there, or if they are in there and it's short or it's not illustrious, they will shove it back and they won't read the whole book. It's, um, it's, it's um, a very me first process. So uh, Richard Ben Kramer, who's one of my idols, uh, who wrote What It Takes, he, he decided not to have an index. And so he, he said for that very reason, he wanted people in Washington to read the damn book. And so I quote him at the end, and that is my inspiration. Now there's an alternative Washington read, which is uh, my colleague David Brooks version, which is, uh, I didn't read your book, but I praised it on television. <laughs> so um, if anyone hasn't read the book, you should absolutely feel free to praise it on television or, or even or even off television. Um, so yeah, but that's a Washington read I would welcome. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I've almost read the book, so I apologize if you've uh, discussed this in the book, but yeah. how do you personally reconcile the fact that as you say in the beginning of the book, you're kind of a product of this whole absurd system. Yep. But by doing this in this expose, you're exposing issues, but also you're going to personally, financially have a lot of gain, just like a lot of these people. As well as, I don't know if this is ironically, <laughs> but your position within the club, even though you might initially not get a few emails or a few hate right. emails, will increase exponentially because of it. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean... I certainly didn't do this for financial gain. I mean, if it turns out to be a financial gain, great. Um, but <laughs> no, I mean, I, I do. I, I, I think my, my, my approach to that, first of all, is transparency. I mean, I, I say very early on, I sort of lay out who I am, why I live here, how long I've lived here, why I choose to live here, how living here affects me, and how I'm clearly not immune to a lot of the the qualities that, that I take to task in here. So um, what's been interesting about the reaction so far has been, I, I would say the worst criticism I've gotten has been in the vein of how dare he? And the how dare he is not that I got anything wrong or not that I violated any confidences or ground rules, but how dare he and that what about those unwritten rules where members of the club are not supposed to write critically about other members of the club? Um, I mean. Isn't that sort of a violation? Isn't that a turn? I mean, I think I was on uh, George Stephanopoulos's show last Sunday, not not yesterday, but a week ago, or no, whatever, a week ago, and he his first question was, "Isn't this uncomfortable for you?" Um, and I didn't think to respond like this at the time, but what I should have said was, "Not really, but uh, if it is, I, I welcome discomfort. I mean, I think discomfort. There's not enough discomfort in Washington journalism. I think it's a very comfortable." moment in Washington. I mean, I think one of the dis misconceptions about Washington is it's a really tough town. I actually think Washington's a pretty easy town. I mean, I think it's a town these days of pretty easy, I mean, wealth, if, if for lack, if that's the right term, easy fame, easy second acts, and um, I'm not really worried at all. I mean, I, I'll have encounters with people. I had one today with someone who didn't like how he was characterized. Um, but I mean, Jay Carney was asked in the, in the White House briefing today, so have you read Mark Leibovich's book? And he, th he then had a great answer. He said, uh, well, no, but I'm hoping to get invited to the book party. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I immediately uh, sent him an invitation to the book party. And, and he immediately wrote back saying, I can't believe you've reduced me to groveling from the podium. <laughs> um, but again, this is an example of, of kind of this town parodying itself like in real time. Um, but no, look, I mean, this is who I am. This is, I, I'm writing from the inside. I write from it willingly, and I welcome any discomfort, if, if not soul searching, um, it brings about. So, yeah. Hi. hi. Um, I was listening to your reading of the Russet Memorial, and I mm -hmm. was thinking about there's a, there's a moment on TV that would seem so real to me. It was when Luke 
Russ said at the end, I think it was a week or two after he passed away, mm-hmm. he was he was at his dad's chair as they faded yeah. out. And I right. took that as a sincere moment, but after listening to you, how much is sincere? In I, yeah, I mean, I, that's a, I'm glad you raised this. I mean, Luke Russert had just lost his father. Luke yeah. Russert had just lost his best friend. And I think what I read might have sounded, the, the, without the full context of the book, might have sounded disrespectful of that. I, I don't mean that in any way. In fact, Luke Russert, given what he what he went through, I mean, they were genuinely close. They would talk every day. Um, he was, I think, prematurely given a job that immediately had half the town talking nepotism, you know, snarking about, you know, you know, why is he in this job, including, I guess, me right here. Um, and um, I've gotten to know him, and he's, he's a good guy, and he gets a lot of what I'm writing about because people are trying to sort of posthumously network <laughs> with him through their memories of his father. I mean, he, he Luke's always talking about the parasitic environment of people coming up to him, and I mean, because he's a reporter for NBC now, or MSNBC, and, and sort of talking about how he is, uh, people say, well, t- your, your father was a giant. I loved your father, or I grew up in Buffalo with your father, as a way to get something from him. And I mean, Tim Russert and Luke Russert now know exactly That's good what is going on. But yes, I, 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 I think I want to, so, yeah, I mean, I'm very, very empathetic to what he went through and, and actually think he's handled himself well. Thank you. Yeah. What? yeah. Curious to uh, find out whether uh, Heilman's and Halpern's tome served as any type of template as to your approach regarding methodology, uh, formation of how you were going to put forth content and so forth. Did that have any... Um, uh, benchmarks or, or, or points for you in, in your going forth with us? Um, well, one model I like to use is the fact that they got a $5 million book on their oh, deal right. on their next book and an HBO <laughs> movie out of it. No, I mean, Game Change was, um, it was a really well done book. I mean, I, I think there are two pretty built in structures in nonfiction political books. I mean, one is memoir and one is the campaign book. And both have a beginning, I mean, both have a structure. I mean, a memoir is a life, a campaign has a beginning, middle, and an end. You have the culmination. Um, I yearned, period, I mean, throughout this process for a beginning to end. You find out who wins at the end, kind of through line, whether it's one character, whether it's a race, whether it's a campaign, whether it's um, a, a one person search or something. Um, I mean, look, I mean, that's a very, it was a very fast written book. They, they obviously got a lot of material. I think they marketed it really, really well. Um, but no, very, very different book. Um, I mean, would love it to do as well. But it, it's, it's a book that I sort of wanted not to like because probably of jealousy. But I really did like it. <laughs> and, um, and so I admire them for that. And I'm interested to see what they come up with for the next one. And just as a quick follow-up, I mean, going forward, do you have legitimate concerns for yourself as to access? None. I mean, I really (laughs) don't. I mean, look, I mean, I've been doing political profiles for years, and some of them are really tough. And, um, I mean, a few things. I mean, one, I work for a major news organization, so I don't think for a second that it's me that's invited to these parties. It's my news organization. It's my job that's invited Mm -hmm. to these parties, right? And I think one of the things that happens in this town is that people accrue their own identity to what they think, you know, their, their job title, the fuss people make over them, the degree to which people suck up to them. Mm-hmm. And um, look, if people feel that it will benefit them to be written about in the New York Times and to be quoted in the New York Times, they will talk to me. Um, but no, I mean, I don't feel like I personally betrayed anyone or, or violated any trusts. And um, if I did, I think I might have problems legitimately, but I, I'm really not worried at all. So, Thank you. Great. Thanks. I still think it's a noble endeavor when somebody decides to throw their hat in the ring and become a politician. Totally agree. I just don't think it's their fault that the coverage of them is so shallow. What do you think? Um, I think it's a chicken egg thing. I mean, I think, look, I mean, I think that they appeal to the lowest common denominator if they think they're going to get votes. And I think the media covers the lowest common denominator if they think they're going to get ratings or page clicks and, and what have you. I mean, I think that America gets the political system and the media that it probably deserves. So, I mean, yes, I think it's very noble. I, I wouldn't want to do it, but I do I, I do think, and, and one thing that I've learned over the last few years, I think there's an incredible hunger for authenticity. 
there was an incredible hunger. And if you look at the John McCain campaign of 2000, or, or even if you look at people, I mean, very, it usually happens in the Republican Party, but not always, but I mean, people warming up to Herman Cain and getting excited about Sarah Palin, getting excited about, I mean, anything that, or Ross Perot, I mean, anything that screams of something new or different or someone who is being straight with you. Um, I mean, I think it's a yearning that, I mean, I think it's constant. I think it just keeps growing. So, yeah. I wonder if you, you could um, talk a little bit about Politico. Um, <clears throat> uh, I know you, you wrote that big piece about Mike Allen a few years ago. Right. Uh, uh, and I'm kind of wondering, is, is Politico sort of a logical result of all of this crazy silliness, or did these guys have such a brilliant idea that they kind of captured the moment and then yeah. all the lazy reporters just write what they say? <laughs> I, I actually think both are true. I mean, I think they have created, uh, I think, a, exactly the kind of product that that they wanted to, and one that, look, there is obviously an appetite for. I mean, political junkies crave what they provide, which is a lot of news, sometimes a little bit shallow, but just they break news, they amplify news, they they promote themselves. I mean, I don't know if people want that, but look, I mean, they are appealing to a junkie culture, and Washington is filled with political junkies, and I'm one of them, and I think, one of the reasons I think Politico might have unfairly, might have suffered a little bit in this book because, mostly because I'm sort of familiar with their work because I read them a few times a day. I probably read them more closely than I do other publications that I shouldn't name here. But um, look, I mean, I know the people who started it. I mean, I know Mike and, and I think that they had, that they've really stuck to their vision. Um, I don't, I think it's, again, I think it just is. I don't think it's good or bad. I just think it is, and I think the market sort of bears it out. I mean, I do think it'll be interesting to see where they go from here because um, what they do costs a lot of money, and they have some very good reporters there. I mean, they break some big stories, and um, I do wish them the best. I, I don't quite know why they're so obsessed with me and the book and, um, <laughs> and why they, I don't know. They, they're decided that, that they are an aggrieved party, but every time they write about it, it, it seems to help sales. So, yeah, yeah. yeah you and then you. Uh, you've alluded to some of your profiles. Uh, I think one of your best before this book was the profile you did, I think, in 2008 on Chris Matthews. And uh, it touched on a lot of these themes. And I'm curious right. if that uh, was an impetus for the book. And uh, right. also, could you share maybe one of the best stories from, from that uh, experience? From the Chris Matthews yeah. experience? Um, Actually, some of it somewhere in the book. I mean, Chris Matthews. I look. I, I do have a bias to characters. I like people who are characters, and I like people who are kind of not afraid to let you see who they are. And Chris Matthews is has very no filtering device. I mean, he's just this loud kind of carnival barker of a political commentator. Uh, loves politics, unabashed about that. I mean, he's a character. And in this profile that you're referring to, I, I spent quite a bit of time with him. It was during the primaries in 2008. Chris um, just gave me the full Chris, and the tape recorder was working, and uh, I wrote about it. And I think pretty much everyone who knows him says I captured him. But look, I mean, everyone has their own story. Everyone has their own version of how they want to be viewed, and especially in Washington, because everyone's, like I said in, in the book, is constantly writing the story of their own lives, right? And then a guy like me comes around and writes a different story or writes sort of an alternative view. So, look, I, I, Chris, there, there's a scene at the end of the book when I, I write about, this, it's a party at Ben Bradley and Sally Quinn's house over this last Christmas. And Chris Matthews, the last, the first party I went to at Ben Bradley and Sally Quinn's house was four years ago, right before the first inauguration for Barack Obama. And I just written that story and Chris Matthews said, he, he kept storming away from me, he, he was not happy with me and he kept, um, <laughs> he kept saying, you cost me a job I really, really wanted. And I had no idea what he was talking about. I think it was either, I, I didn't know if it was the meet the press job because that was open for a while. I didn't know if it was, he was thinking about running for Senate in Pennsylvania. Um, anyway, then he sort of stormed away and actually Ben Bradley sort of um, overheard this and he kind of like shrugged, this was four years ago. And he said, uh, well, my kids are here, but he said, gum. Um, um, and then he told me to, Keep your pecker up, which is a, a big. That's Ben's big, um, big. That's what he tells people when. I don't know. 
Yeah. Um, anyway, so, but then four years later at the, the last party, which is the last chapter in the book, um, I saw Chris at the same buffet table and um, Chris said, you know, you're an assassin, but you're a mensch. And, and the fact that I like you again proves I'm not really Irish. And I think that that was great. I thought that was like a great moment. And um, so um, he actually had me on Hardball once about a year ago and I was fully prepared for him to like litigate everything. I mean, just go completely public and I was gonna have to have one of those like cable shouting matches. But um, yeah, no, I mean, Chris Matthews was fun. I mean, it's, I, I, I enjoy him. I think on some level he probably enjoyed the process, although it probably took a while. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, who are the good guys in your book? And, uh, um, and a second question, how does Obama fit in this uh, culture you've biopsied? Uh, good questions. I mean, I think it, it's funny. I mean, I, I, I'll sort of give a blanket Washington, like totally unsatisfying Washington answer on the good guys, which is, it's not really for me to say, but I do think, I mean, people who have read this have said that Harry Reid and Tom Coburn, uh, who are principals in a chapter called Three Senators for Our Time, uh, they sort of learned a great deal about them. And these are two senators who are absolute opposites. They are opposite sides of the institution. One is an institutionalist, one is a hairball. Coburn's a hairball, I mean that in a good way. Uh, one is a very, very conservative Republican, one of the fathers of the Tea Party. One is, you know, as partisan and as powerful a Democrat as there is on the Hill. Uh, they hate each other, they're completely they, they despise each other for reasons I say, but um, I don't know, people seem to have come away from, from the really liking them more, and I do think that they both are two of the more honest people I have gotten to know over the years for reasons I, I lay out. Um, look, I mean, uh, what was the second question? It was, oh, Obama. Well, I mean, Obama is, you know, his change brigade begins the book. I mean, his election basically begins the book, and he has said, he said one of his biggest challenges in 2008, he was gonna change Washington. I mean, that was his, it was his reason for running. And he has said explicitly since then, he failed, failed miserably at changing Washington. Um, Barack Obama and any president, I, I'm always sort of intimidated by writing about them because I find the modern presidency to be so unknowable in a way. I think the job is so superhuman, I mean, requiring levels of stamina and responsibility and scrutiny that I, I think has always been awesome, but I think in this day and age, I mean, I can't even begin to get my head around what that must be like. But I do think that his White House, if you look at the people who designed his 2008 campaign, who were going to reject the Washington game, who were going to not deal with super PACs in 2012 and not opt out of the campaign finance system in 2008 and not allow lobbyists into the White House um, and then repeatedly saying, never mind, never mind, never mind. It's unclear how hard they really tried to, to really engage Republicans in, in meeting even two thirds of the way or halfway. Um, look, I, I, I will say this, I mean, I think change and hope was a great marketing strategy, probably got him elected. Um, he's obviously a very gifted man. Um, I think there's a scene towards the end of the book in which they're having a strategy meeting, the, the team in Chicago and the sort of fledgling re-election campaign and the White House staff. And Obama convened it on a Saturday. And he said, look, there are 15 people in here. The group's kind of big. I hope I can trust you guys. I want to speak frankly. I want to speak like we did in 2008 and um, you know, really have a give and take. In about the fourth or fifth meeting, the president made a list of things that he wished he had been more vocal about in his first term. I mean, Guantanamo, immigration, gay marriage, um, uh, I'm missing a few, uh, climate change was one, right. And um, sure enough, John Heilman, I think one of the, the authors of Game Change came to Jim Messina, the campaign manager about a week later and said, hey Jim, what about this? And so Messina immediately told the president, the president was furious that this privilege meeting would leak, that this information would leak. And so the president comes in at the next meeting and everyone knew he was gonna be pissed. And he said, look guys, I trusted you, you know? 
I loved these meetings. They were really frank. They were really good. I think they were productive. I hope they will continue in some form. If they do, I'm not going to be part of them. He got up and left. And um, Vice President Biden chewed out everyone for letting the president down. And then there was this recriminations meeting, and everyone was just sort of soul searching. They said, how did this happen? What happened to us? And Robert Gibbs, who was the press secretary early on, uh, he said it was the kind of meeting where we asked, did we change Washington or did Washington change us? And um, that's how that chapter ends. But I think that, look, I, I don't think they did a very good job changing Washington. I, I don't think it's their fault in many ways. I think partly it is their fault. And look, being president's a tough job. And uh, he's got some more time. So. Before I ask you my question, I really wanted to say thank you. I didn't know that I've come to this meeting today. Um, I am a recent, yeah, sorry, I'm short. She was thanking me. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to thank you. I uh, recently graduated with my undergraduate and moved to DC. And um, in the midst of applying and interviewing and being discouraged by what is DC, I was reminded from your book why I came here. And that was because I wanted to do good, because I want to change something. And um, it's hard to think that when you're a part of the institution. So my question for you is, being a father and being a DC professional, what advice do you give to young people like me who are coming here to do the good in an institution that isn't doing good? Right. Uh, thank you, by the way. That's a great question. I really appreciate it. I mean, wow. I mean, look, I mean, hold on to that. I mean, I think one of the... I mean, people have read this as a cynical book, I think, with good reason. But I, I think I wrote this on some level from a place of idealism and a place of maybe optimism just because I, I want to feel good about the capital city. I want to feel good about the world my, my kids are growing up in, li literally in Washington. And, and again, we like our life here. And um, I, I don't. My, my advice is just um, hold on to that, you know? I mean, it's a very, very powerful impulse. I don't think you're going to, I mean, people evolve, obviously, but I, I think that, that that's just a really, really unique and special impulse, and I think it's what brings a lot of people here. I mean, you have these starstruck people, usually quite young, who descend on the city and, and really revivify it in a way that's, I think, really cool every, you know, four years, and some people do it because they want to be like Josh Lyman or, or some, you know, House of Cards character. Um, and you know, one of the things that's happened is that Hollywood has come to define a lot of these archetypes, which is kind of unfortunate because they're usually not very noble. Um, but well, our, I guess Josh Lyman was sort of noble. But no, just hang on to it. I mean, I, I do, I would love this book to be a source of at least some kind of motivation for good. I mean, it was never something I, 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 would, I would just love it. I mean, I, I just love hearing your question. I hope you hang on to it. So, so. All right. Thanks. <laughs>